Hey, how's it going everyone? My name is Brandon Clements and welcome back to another video here on Glass Hand. Today it's very exciting and I'm super happy to show you guys this project because this actually came about when I was looking on stash uh, stashmedia.tv and I came across this project and it's super cool. Uh, I'll definitely link it down below if you guys want to check it out. But uh, I, I was looking at this and I was like, oh, this is such an awesome product. You know, it's uh, a collaboration with the NBA and it's absolutely perfect for motion design. So uh, I'm actually going to play what we're going to create right now and I'm going to show you every single step and every shot and how we set it up inside of Unreal Engine. So let's go ahead and roll the footage. Okay, so we're going to run through the whole project start to finish just so we know exactly how does one create a project like that in Unreal Engine uh, using Unreal Engine. So uh, the meshes were created uh, in Blender. Actually, these meshes in particular were purchased and then modified um, so that they would resemble the, the skew or the colorway for the NBA Crocs. So uh, you can see here... This is a basketball goal, and I'll link all of these in the uh, comment section below in case you guys wanted to check them out. Um, but I used a basketball goal. Um, I also got this basketball, which has some weird kind of texture blending on it, but I just went ahead and kept it because motion blur, you know how it is. And, uh, and then we got these croc slides here, and I brought those into Substance Painter and uh, just, I'll run you through Substance Painter really fast. Uh, there's really not a whole lot here. Um, that's very interesting, but uh, yeah, just laid down a basic um, color and then I used this polka dot uh, pattern that I believe I got from Substance Source. Um, it's just a uh, smart material, if you will. Uh, it's got some parameters here. I just changed the color and then I used uh, the pen tool to draw stripes and then I just projected the graphic um, literally by dragging and dropping the graphic from my uh, browser here onto the slipper and onto this part here. So really just simple stuff. Uh, just wanted to show you guys um, what that kind of looks like. So in case you were wondering, uh, but back to Unreal Engine, once you have everything imported, uh, I just brought it in, created folders, uh, brought in the textures, shaders are nothing special in this project. Um, and then this is mostly, this is the first scene that I created. Uh, and then I actually duplicated this level for every single um, scene. And then I utilized the sequence uh, inside of the level itself. So in the motion design toolkit, you do have a sequence that is loaded into the level automatically for you. It's just there uh, and it lives inside of the level asset. So we got NBA Crocs two and three. And then the rest of these are from my previous tutorials, which you, if you haven't seen, uh, definitely check them out on the channel. It will run you through all the basics of motion design. If this is uh, your first time joining me. Okay. So um, let's run through Actually, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make my window just a little bit bigger for you guys. Uh, I always try to do this, so we'll increase this a little bit, just in case we're watching it in 4K. It'll be a little bit easier to watch back. And I'm also going to hide my face because a lot of important details show up here in this bottom corner. Okay, so I'm going to change this to Game View by hitting the controller icon here. There's a ton of different icons that I definitely uh, want you to check out because I keep forgetting that they're here. Uh, we got things like post-process effects, high-resolution screenshot, aligning actors, colors, um, all kinds of great stuff here. Uh, ways to align and isolate your actors to viewports. So please don't forget about these down here because they're super nice, uh, especially when I was designing this uh, animation. Okay, so uh, I'll just go ahead and just play the animation real quick for you so you can watch it back in real time. Uh, but yeah, so we're using like the camera to actually boom in and down and then uh, rotating that. And you can see that here uh, in the other viewport, the motion and the track that I'm using. So I'm using the camera rig rails, I believe is what they call. Uh, and then uh, we got some other fun stuff. So let me go ahead and pause this real quick. Uh, to do the basketball floor, this was actually super fun uh, to do the court. 
uh, I'm using wooden planks that I imported from uh, Mega Scans. So if I come down here, uh, I do have this wooden plank. This is all we're using for the basketball court. Uh, and then the material is just pretty shiny. Uh, so nothing special, but I'm using the cloner uh, to actually align these boards in a honeycomb pattern. So if you come down here under the details layout, honeycomb, X, Y, uh, we have our width parameters. And this is super easy and fun to set up. Um, and then I just have four different variations. Uh, the variations being the rotation uh, here. So basically it's going to... Uh, randomly select if I come down uh, to this render mode it's gonna randomly select the children of the cloner okay and then you can do some really fun stuff with this you could add an effector and flip the boards over and do some really cool animations um, but yeah once they're in that cloner system they are instance and they're running on the GPU and you can create all kinds of stuff with it and so I have a decal on top of that to get something uh, that resembles a court. So that decal actor um, and the material is super simple. It's just an image of a basketball court going into the opacity and into the base color. And that gets projected onto the court itself. So if I turn this off um, and on, you can see how that fits. And that was really nice to design the actual camera angle. Uh, that I wanted so you know this actually wouldn't be the correct distance from a free throw line but you know it looks great in the uh, camera itself and if you notice uh, the basketball's got some splotchy kind of weirdness to it uh, I'm gonna go ahead and switch this to the nanite view really quick nanite uh, triangle view just so you can see that it is nanite rendering here but there is one of the lights um, in the scene is actually using ray trace shadows. So in order to utilize ray tracing with Nanite, you need to invoke r.raytracing.nanite.mode and then set that to one. And that will actually get closer to the, uh, to the actual mesh to the correct LOD zero, if you will. Uh, we're not actually using LODs with with nanite but you know what i mean it's a, it's the actual high resolution asset is being uh traced for the shadows um so that's a performance thing and and you can change that if you'd like okay so let's talk about how the basketball is being animated uh this is an actual sorry uh this is a blueprint we're going to come back to this uh because i think that's probably one of the more complicated things in this scene let's talk about the uh, if I switch this to motion design and you come down to camera, you have the, let's see, let me pull this out just a little bit, camera rig rail. So if you double click, this will add this camera rig rail actor to the scene. And that's what's guiding this camera. So uh, you can see under this default scene null, and I can actually change the color of that. Uh, I keep forgetting to show um, how you can do that. It's really neat. Um, that you can organize everything in the motion design outliner. Uh, but underneath this default scene node is the uh, camera look at and the camera rig rail system. And uh, this actually was super fast to <laughs> visualize and just bring into the viewport. Um, literally double clicked and then it gives you a spline component, this rail spline component. And uh, you start dragging these dots out. So if you click on one of these dots, there we go. Uh, you can actually edit this spline at any time that you like. And uh, then you can also hold alt drag to create new spline points. Um, so as you drag that out, you find the curve that is uh, exactly what you want. And then I'm using the look at, which is just a null. So if you come up to the actors, double click on the null actor. This is just a transform. It's a, it's a non-renderable asset. Uh, or I should say actor that's in the scene. Uh, everything inside of Unreal Engine that lives inside of a level is called an actor. Uh, just if you are new to Unreal Engine, that's some terminology for you. But if I go to the camera and then I scroll down a little bit, you can see that my focus mode is set to tracking and the actor to track is, uh, you can see persistent level dot Ava null actor underscore two, which is the uh, camera look at uh, right here. So that's what I'm using to uh, target that camera look at. So 
Uh, that actually just stays put. It, I think it's slightly animated at the very end, uh, which, by the way, let's just hop down into the sequencer here so we can talk about what is and isn't animated in this scene. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty standard. Um, I'm using right mouse uh, to click and hold and turn my uh, hand into or turn my mouse cursor into this little hand. And then I'm using alt shift to uh, and right click to expand uh, or you can just roll your mouse wheel holding control. That's another way to kind of zoom in and out. But um, yeah, these shortcuts are very handy, especially in the graph editor, um, which I used a lot. Uh, in this project just to kind of finesse uh, the timing of the animation. So um, we'll come back to the ball. The ball is actually a, a blueprint, um, but I just want to show you exactly what's animated. So this is our ball. So BP underscore follow spline. I named this class, this blueprint actor class follow spline to be generic uh, so that I could add any type of static mesh uh, to a spline and animate it um, very, very easily. And you can see I got uh, something called spin in progress to allow the ball to actually spin. And the progress is the animation of the ball uh, over the start and end point of the spline. So super, super easy. You may be used to some of that in um, Cinema 4D. They have, a, they have a tag in there. It's called like follow spline or something like that. Uh, it's been a while since I've used Cinema 4D. Uh, now that Unreal Engine has become my main tool set, that and Blender. Uh, but yeah, uh, you can do the same thing just with a blueprint. Super, super easy. Um, and then we have this uh, look at, so you can tell that this one is just kind of going down um, as the camera plunges into the rim. And then we have the camera rig rail. So if we parent the camera underneath the camera rig rail, we automatically can use the attribute uh, camera uh, current position on rail is what it's called. So under rail, rail controls camera, I keep saying camera <laughs> current position on rail you want to animate that and that will actually guide the camera along the spline okay so um, I'm also animating our camera actor itself by just rolling it at the end to kind of get that kind of flushing down the toilet uh, what a weird analogy but yeah flushing down the toilet motion we'll call it that that's that's nice right um, one other thing I want to say on the, while well, I'm thinking of it, on the look at actor, there is a very important parameter here. Um, sorry, it's actually on the camera actor itself. If I scroll down to the look at settings, uh, I'm going to try to make this a little bit larger so you can see it. But this look at tracking interpolation speed, okay, since we are rendering these frames incredibly fast, you might see some jerkiness here in the in the camera viewport. But when I actually play the animation and sequencer, it's very smooth. Well, this camera interpret, uh, wow, camera <laughs> tracking interp speed, look at. Um, this value here is set to something I had to play around with. So if I set it to zero, this should feel uh, jarring. Uh, it shouldn't feel it shouldn't feel that smooth. Actually, it it does actually feel pretty smooth. Um, but if I set it to something maybe like I don't know, there we go. Uh, two. So a value of zero must turn this off. But you can see when I have it at two, it really is super laggy. And this is kind of fun to play with because you can do some really cool things. So as I increase this to let's do like 20 or maybe 10, um, you can see that it gets a little bit snappier, but it kind of has this like smooth, like easing to it if you will. So now it kind of really feels like it's kind of lagging. And as I increase this, gets a little bit snappier, but it still has this like interpolation speed to it, which is really neat. Uh, so at 30, I thought it felt pretty interesting. Uh, of course, if you go uh, too high with this, it can start to feel kind of stuttery, but I don't really see it playing back here. Um, so definitely something to check out and play with. If you want that kind of laggy feeling, uh, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty wicked. Uh, but yeah, just something to play with and recognize that it's there uh, because it's really, really cool. And then you have offsets as well. So you can, you can keyframe uh, these offsets uh, if you need to kind of adjust the camera's position uh, in the actual frame, um, I should say. So adjusting framing, uh, use relative offset. It's really, really neat. Uh, and then I have allow roll turned on as well. 
Okay, so that's basically the camera setup. Let's talk about the blueprint. And uh, for those of you out there, I know that blueprints can be uh, intimidating if you're not used to Unreal Engine and Unreal Engine terminology, but trust me, it's actually really easy. Um, and it's going to be your best friend when you're in Unreal Engine because you're going to want to create your own tools at some point. You're going to want to create something that is already not presently available to you in all these different tool sets that they have and modules in the, in the, uh, in the engine. So, uh, let's just crack open BP follow spline. I'll show you how to actually create the blueprint. If you're, if you're brand new to this, right click, and then you want to create a blueprint class. And then you want to use uh, actor as your, um, type that you want to inherit from. So these are different classes based on the, uh, game modes and, uh, different gameplay framework. So actor, um, is going to be anything, like I said, that lives in the level. Um, just like this guy is, it actually lives in the level. So actor is pretty, pretty darn generic when you think about it. Uh, it can be a lot of different things. Okay. So let's crack open this blueprint and I have, um, when you open this, it's going to look a little bit different. So there's tabs here. I'm just going to pull the viewport tab out so I can show you exactly how this works. And uh, what I want to focus on is the construction script. Now the construction script and the event graph, uh, the difference between the two is the construction script can run in the level itself in the editor and the event graph is for runtime. So when you're actually playing the game, uh, so usually you want to have uh, similar logic in your construction script if you're using this for uh, linear storytelling and linear video content um, this applies to you because what you're going to want to run in the editor in sequencer uh, you're going to want to actually run that in the runtime app when you actually render in the movie render queue uh, that may not make sense to you right now but just trust me uh, if you're going to be building tools in blueprints Usually, as a rule of thumb, you want to have whatever logic in the construction script in your event graph so that when you actually do render, it will happen. <laughs> because you don't want it just to happen in the editor. You want it to happen when you actually render the video as well. Okay, cool. So what does all this mean? Um, basically, all this stuff is helping us move the static mesh across the spline okay so let's keep that in mind as we move forward uh, i'm getting a reference to a static mesh component which is up here in the top left and to add components to a blueprint you just click the add button and search for them so i need a static mesh static mesh so right here and then an, a spline component for our path right there and uh, these are kind of the recipe for our blueprint. These are little building blocks that we have inside of the blueprint uh, that actually show up in the level and allow us to do logic on. Okay, so static mesh, I want to get a reference to that. So you can just drag that out into your graph and I need to set the world location of it. And then I also want to set the world or sorry, the relative loca rotation of it. So Location, rotation, because I want to move it along the spline and I actually want to spin it along the spline as well. So how do we know how to set the location of the basketball? Well, it's pretty darn easy. Um, all we just need to do is, this is almost like working backwards in logic here, uh, just to actually put it into the location. But I know I need my spline and I know I need to get a location along that spline. So uh, gosh darn it, they already have a node for us. So we're gonna use that in world space and then we're actually just going to lerp the, the length of the spline uh, over this progress here. So this is just a variable. You can right click and create variables, promote this alpha to variable and I named it progress. So as I move this along um, from zero to one, it actually uh, moves it on the spline itself. So uh, just to show you again, uh, as I move this along, it will move it along the spline. So pretty cool. So th what that actually does this lerp is a linear interpolation. So I'm starting at the very beginning of the spline and then I'm going to get the spline length and put it into B. So from zero to one, uh, I'm going to use this alpha and that's going to give us a distance on any uh, position of this spline. Okay, so I hope that makes sense to you. Uh, it's super easy. You can just copy and paste this and use it. You don't really need to understand it if you need to move something along the spline. There you go. And like I said, you want to have it in the construction script and the event graph. And then also in your class settings, you want to make sure that you have, uh, sorry, under class... 
settings. Yes, I was in the right place. You are so when you drag a blueprint with a construction script, you can uh, set it to run. Uh, so if you set this to true and you drag it in your viewport, it will run the logic. Um, so I usually leave that on. Uh, it's pretty handy. And then you also want to have this turned on, this run construction script in sequencer. So when you're scrubbing the sequencer, it's actually going to run this uh, logic for you. So as you animate our variables, progress and spin, things will happen in the sequencer. You definitely need that. Okay, so that's basically it. Uh, and then yeah, you animate those parameters and you end up with something like this. So pretty neat I hope you guys liked this one. Uh, let's move on to scene number two or shot number two Okay, so here we are in uh, shot number two I just opened this level and we're gonna go ahead and get this set up exactly how I want it So under perspective, I'm gonna change this to motion design viewport I'm also gonna make sure under the hamburger menu that this will allow cinematic control and I'm kind of gonna do the opposite here So I'm gonna set this to default and then uh, not allow cinematic control So when I scrub this line and uh, I actually go into game view uh, We should see everything happening up here and then this will just show us the default viewport as it as it is with all the actors Okay, so let's make a little bit more room and then I'm gonna actually hold uh, alt left click to kind of bring that camera out to that weird position um, that's kind of like an old Maya type of navigation and that will actually snap the camera back so there's no Dutch angle on it and it's just kind of straight on so all right let's look at this scene real quick let's play it back and just see what we have going on I'm gonna move this out of the way so that camera doesn't bump into us uh, but yeah it's um just moving the camera back we have the flip-flop or the slipper standing up and then the ball is just spinning on it uh, so let's look at how all this is working um, there are some things that I didn't mention in the first shot which is lighting and then I'm also using uh, some of these blueprints here to create this like glare uh, in the lens and uh, this is actually an asset that I purchased on the marketplace um, if you want to search custom lens flare VFX, uh, it's just a blueprint that uses a texture that I believe the, um, one of the guys who set this up, the artist who set it up said this was, uh, a lot of different textures that he had generated. And what I'm doing is just changing some of the parameters here that he has exposed. So I'm going to go ahead and just hide my webcam. Uh, some of these parameters that are exposed. These are this is actually really really cool um, You can have these different variations of the light itself So if I was to change this you can see you can get like all different types of really cool looks So highly encourage you to check out this asset if you're doing linear content It's great just to throw in and and have it just show up in your viewport uh, So that's actually how I'm getting the flares here uh, and then also for lighting um I want to do another video on lighting, uh, something that is more physically based lighting in Unreal Engine. I feel like there's not a whole lot of uh, people talking about that, and uh, it's actually really important. And <laughs> I'm going to do the opposite of what I just said and tell you that uh, this scene here is not really physically plausible at all. Uh, I was trying to match a look, so I'm using a lot of different point lights in here, and I'm also using a lot of different spotlights that uh, have like a focus cone angle to it, and also a certain radius and length, uh, just to give me the highlights um, on the product that I wanted. Uh, but this is kind of counterintuitive to how I would normally light a scene. Uh, especially talking about tone mapping and exposure and and all that stuff I, I'm just kind of going wild with it in this scene and placing uh, all these things around which Unreal Engine the you know with Lumen and Nanite it's in virtual shadow maps and all these technologies coming to play together it's actually really flexible um, to be able to set up a um, an art directable type of scene and I'm almost just painting with these lights uh, if you will. So they're just, they're just positioned around the scene to just kind of highlight things that I, that I want to highlight in the scene itself. Uh, I promise I'll do an actual video on lighting that is more physically based, uh, for everyone who's coming from the film world and the uh, motion design world. Uh, I'll, I'll do a video on that. I promise you just got to hold me to it. <laughs> okay. So, um, I think that covers that. Um, also, one thing I didn't mention about the decal, uh, if you notice the slipper doesn't actually have the decal texture on it because there is an attribute in here, I'm gonna have my webcam, called uh, receives decal. So if I show that, if I can spell, 
let's just type decal there we go it receives decal that is set to false if that's turned on you can see it looks like i got some spray paint uh, on the product so uh this is kind of a give and take with the debuffer that's in the engine one of the graphics buffers that creates the decals um you kind of have to pick like do you want to receive it or not so that's kind of like a boolean type thing that's on most meshes in the scene and uh, skeletal meshes Okay, cool. So let's break this down uh, in terms of animation. Let's look at that. So I do have two different cameras and camera cuts in my camera cut track. Uh, so if you're not familiar with camera cuts, uh, it's just a way like in Blender, if you're used to binding cameras in your timeline, uh, that's how you can do it here in Unreal Engine just to switch between two different cameras. I basically animated one camera pulling back and rolling uh, Dutch to uh, to then just copy it and duplicate it and create the second shot. So that was my methodology there. And I just really just used the, uh, the real-time rendering features here in the engine to get exactly what I wanted. Once I was happy, I just duplicated it, changed the lens, maybe went into the graph editor, kind of moved the keyframes, um, which is super nice. Uh, I, I don't talk enough about the graph editor, but if I was to grab, let's say, um, one of the location values here, uh, so this is the camera moving backwards. So I just select the uh, the linear keyframes here just to make it look like it was pulled in the shot and it was cut. Um, if I was to go back to the first shot, there we go. And then I use the middle mouse button and holding shift, I can kind of lock it to my vertical up and down. And so, man, uh, using this is like so nice uh, to be able to get the exact kind of keyframe position that you want. Um, in your scene. So highly recommend that you keep this up on another monitor and be able to tweak all these different keyframes. Uh, and then you can also change the keyframe interpolation at the top. So uh, let me show you real quick. We'll just go back to the transform location. If I wanted this to be an easy ease, I can just uh, set this to like cubic interpolation, this automatic tangents. Uh, and then if I want to break the tangents, I can use broken tangents. And then if I want to toggle the weight of those tangents, uh, I can use this. And then uh, I can really get kind of wacky uh, with how I'm moving these. So I got both of them selected and you can see that I can just have the freedom uh, to move one tangent side or the other. Okay, so just wanted to show you that. Um, definitely, definitely use the sequence um, graph editor. Okay, and the only other thing that's animated here is uh, just some attributes, I think. Oh yeah, I'm just moving these lights a little bit, just subtly, very subtly in the frame. And the basketball is using an animator. So if I come up to the uh, operator stack animator, you can see that I am just globally just spinning the basketball on the yaw itself and the time source is set to world so um yeah it's just gonna actually tick and spin in the world uh you can change this to manual or sequence so you can have it adhere to the sequence itself so if i do change that to sequence uh this is a little bit broken in the current version of uh the motion design tools. I know there's been some uh, people using this and it doesn't quite render exactly how you would like it to in the movie render queue. But you can see the idea is if I move the timeline, uh, then the ball will animate. Okay. But uh, setting it to world and just having it tick um, totally makes it render fine in the movie render queue itself. Okay, so the second shot, not too complicated. It's more just like compositionally, it's more like a beauty shot type thing. Okay, so let's move on to the third and final shot and probably the most complicated of the three. Okay, so there's a lot going on in this scene. Uh, let's go ahead and back it up. Uh, I actually love this scene. I had a fantastic time uh, just using the tools in the engine to create this. Uh, so I am actually breaking the rules a little bit, if you will. I'm kind of creating my own tools to allow this to happen, which is the beauty of Unreal Engine. Um, you know, if you were to set this up in like Cinema 4D or Houdini, uh, you would be doing, or, or even Blender, uh, you'd be doing basically the same type of steps as what I'm about to show you in here. But... Um, a lot of what I'm going to show you is going to change in the future because Unreal 
uh, or I should say Epic Games, they are hard at work creating all these tools and they're doing an excellent job. Uh, they really are listening to the community and a lot of these suggestions and a lot of what I'm even doing, they're listening to and implementing. So these tools are going to change and they're going to evolve and they're going to be a lot more flexible than they are right now. But I'm going to show you how to get around it, man, because rules are meant to be broken, right? As artists, <laughs> we're supposed to break those rules. Okay, cool. So... Uh, basically the scene is set up almost identical to the first two scenes. So, uh, really just kind of building on the ideas. Even the lighting is very similar as the last two scenes. Again, um, just using some point lights. Uh, I am using this area light here. That's kind of large at the bottom to catch some, uh, very subtle, uh, highlights on the bottom of the slipper. And then, uh, an, an, another top light just to kind of catch uh, and fill some more of this kind of darkness that's shown on the inside of the slipper and also for the basketballs themselves um, to catch the top and bottom. Uh, other than that, no HDRIs, uh, just more of these kind of blueprint thingies here. I got really addicted to putting these into the scene and just having fun with them. Uh, Post-process, I haven't shown you uh, the post-process settings, but they're very, very standard, like out-of-the-box post-process, especially this Ava post-process, which you can find under the uh, uh, motion design, and then come down to cameras, and then double-click, you can add this to your scene. Okay, so this will kind of like um, set this to more film-type quality, uh, and then, yeah, I think the only thing I changed was just the, made sure we were using Lumen, uh, this is the, these settings are exactly the same for every single scene, uh, so I'm not tracing every single pixel for uh, ray tracing every single uh, reflection, um, but I am using the hit lighting for reflection ray trace mode. Uh, set the quality to four. Um, you know, set at least two bounces here, and then for global illumination, uh, again quality settings pretty much cranked up as high as they can go. Um, other than that pretty standard out of the box uh, solution. Uh, I also on bloom, I'm set that to convolution uh, exposure. Uh, I just set that to zero and kind of locked the uh, EV 100 to one. Uh, this is very standard out of the box uh, Ava post-processing. So if you see Ava in the, in the engine, if you're curious, it was meant for avalanche. It's a prefix for Avalanche is what the code name was for the motion design module. Okay. So I think the only big thing we need to talk about here, let's get the small stuff out of the way. Um, so um, there I'm trying to at least answer every question that you may have. Uh, the croc is just spinning. Uh, it's just keyframes. Uh, and I just kind of use the uh, tangents here to do some fun stuff with the rotation so you can see I really went wacky here with the graph editor to kind of like get it to pick up and move a certain way as as this continues on it kind of moves faster as the ball kind of like <laughs> breaks open the balls do and and kind of like clones itself if you will uh, we'll come back to this blueprint here that I've created and also to the cloners itself. Uh, and then again, the camera is just very subtly animating. It's just moving, uh, I, th I believe just a little bit closer. That's about it. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's about it for this scene. So the cool thing that's happening is the cloners and this BP underscore motion design spiral spline. Okay. So I'm going to crack this open. Uh, hold on to your wigs because it's it's a little weird <laughs> how I set it up, but um, this kind of allowed me to animate the spline, if you will. Um, so all of this is literally just to create the spiral. Okay, so it's just a little bit of math, and uh, we're clearing the points. We're gonna loop through all the points that are set to a variable. So I can change the number of uh, points on the spline. And then I'm just gonna add those points back into the spline itself. So I'm basically just deleting all the points and creating like a spiral helix and just adding points. 
um, along that spline. Uh, I'm also doing the exact same thing on the event graph. And uh, I did try to reverse the spline order, but I couldn't quite get it to work exactly how I wanted it to. So that's all that is right there. This is just uh, set to call an editor. So this creates a button that tries to uh, change the keys for the spline points itself. But again, I didn't really have it working like I wanted it to. So I kind of gave up on that. So the main controls here for the spline, uh, let's go back to the editor so we can play with it and have fun. Um, but the main controls here and what's being animated is I have a vortex uh, variable and then I have this multiplier um, to actually make it like a vortice, like a, like a vortex. So um, I also have variables for radius, for the height, and uh, that's basically it. And I just threw it into the spline group itself. Oh, and then of course I can create how many ever spline segments that I want. So the great thing is, is once you have this set up, uh, you can change, let's, let's select both of these. So they kind of move uh, as one unit. So I can change uh, how many um, spirals and how many points I want on this. So you can see, I can get really crazy uh, and add 30 to it and uh, then the balls follow that um, it's a little harder harder to see and if i was to crank up the clones um on both of these to like uh i don't know 60 or so uh then you can see that i can kind of create whatever i want uh, of course the uh, the the effector for the size and everything is uh being kind of wacky so let me just uh let me just disable this i think this is only for the spin Sadly, yes, that is only for the spin. Um, but yes, you can come in here and change any of these parameters. Uh, so I can set the scale back to how it was. And then I'm using something in here to uh, change everything. So this is the the step value here. So yeah, this, this should be, um, if I disable this, then you can see they just kind of go back to tiny basketballs. And uh, I do have, uh, the children set to a very small number. So if I was to set this back, uh, there you go. Then you can see that we're able to change all this stuff. So if I was to increase this number, you can see the progress is being animated as we go out. So uh, there's only a few basketballs and then yeah, they they become more. So I really just want to illustrate to you that you can kind of design this however you want in engine, uh, you know, set up the spirals mathematically, uh, give yourself some parameters to just go to town and just kind of create whatever you want. So, uh, let me reopen this scene real quick. Uh, so, um, it doesn't look all wacky. Okay, yeah, so I can't stress enough uh, how how powerful it is to be able to create your own uh, tools just inheriting from some of the motion design uh, classes that are already set up for you. So um, let me show you how that was made, the blueprint for the spline. If I go to the uh, blueprint class here, and I'm creating a new one, and I just want to inherit from the Ava spline actor. Okay, so this is the same class that appears when you create um, over here under motion design it's the same class that is right here the spline actor and it's a special class because this spline actor is the only spline that can interact with the cloner system in this in this day on this day when i'm recording this this probably will change i just want to keep saying that uh because i probably can't say that enough but anywho um you can see when I scroll down under the cloner, I have the layout set to spline. And then again, I can change the count of that. So I can add more or less basketballs as I see fit. Uh, and then I'm sampling my blueprint motion design spiral spline class that I've inherited from. So uh, when you use inheritance, in Unreal Engine or programming, you're basically just saying, give me all the properties of the parent that I'm inheriting from, but just let me mess around with some stuff. Let me get my hands messy and kind of do my own little thing with it. Uh, so then we set it to orient that mesh. We set it to iterate. I have the basketballs facing the camera plane and we are animating this progress value. So that's what 
actually adds the basketballs onto the screen as the progress. And then um, you saw before I have the static mesh set to a very small scale and then I am incrementing this um, using this step and what the step does is um, you can see from the from the side angle uh, the very last basketballs are tiny and the ones in the front are the size that I want so this just gives me the illusion that it's actually going back a lot further than what it is it's a forced perspective if you will uh, and that's what kind of gives me the interesting look inside of the camera Okay, so that's about it on the cloner setting itself. Of course, I do have this spin effector. Let me just show you what that's doing. This actually didn't render properly in the movie render queue. And I am, you know, I think the reason why is because uh, of what I'm doing in the blueprint for the spline. I'm actually uh, clearing the spline and setting the... Uh, the points of the spline every single frame and I think that's kind of messing this up a little bit but I'm sure that will be resolved in the future so I just want to mention to you that this can happen uh, with the cloners uh, selected you can add this spin effector and if you go down I just have this orientation force enabled uh, and what this does is it just spins it on the y-axis so we have a min and max here so uh, the smallest amount will be pretty much nothing, and the highest amount will only be two uh, based on this factor, okay? And make sure that you add the effector to the array on the cloner itself. And I just realized I had my face up, okay? <laughs> so uh, let, let me show you that one more time. Under spin effector, mode, sorry, at force, Go ahead and make this true, and then on the min and max, I have it 0 and 2 on the Y. And that's just allowing it to spin, so nothing crazy. Uh, but let's look at this uh, one more time. We're going to crack this open, and I'm just going to walk you through my methodology here to create that spiral spline. Uh, so from the top blueprint class, we're going to search for spline. We're going to inherit from the Ava spline actor, and then you can click select and name it whatever you want. Okay. And then once you crack that open in the construction script, once again, uh, all we are doing is uh, I'm, I'm clearing the spline points right out of the gates and updating that. Um, now, this is probably something you don't want to do, uh, but it did work for me. So it's kind of one of those things like, the ideally what you would want is just to set the points every single frame and not have to clear the points and set them every frame but you know uh, try it out see if it works for you it worked for me uh, and then do a for loop and uh, the last index of the spline segments I have this set to a variable okay so um, so we're gonna loop through this as many times as we want for uh, spline points or the segments and uh, this is kind of uh, a mess <laughs> I have to admit but we're basically just using sine and cosine uh, to set the vector the vector for x and y, and then we're also just taking uh, the index out of the loop, and we're multiplying it by a variable called height. Uh, that's what we're going to use to drive the height of the spline, and then uh, we're dividing it by the spline segments. And the reason why is, uh, let me show you real quick. So, if I didn't have that division. Uh, when I move the spline height, uh, sorry, let me show. If I move the spline height, there we go. It would actually change the the uh, segments itself. So this just kind of allows me to kind of do this like springy type thing. Um, so if you try to create this yourself, you'll know exactly what I mean. And that's a great tip for you um, when you go to do it. So let's go back to the blueprint. Um, again, we're just using cosine and sine for x and y, respectively. Uh, we take the index, we multiply it by this mult um, value. This is just a factor that I'm using to animate with. Uh, take the product of that and multiply it by another factor called radius. And then we're using this uh, linear interpolation. I'm just using the alpha, calling it vortex. And uh, what this allows me to do is blend between A and B for X and Y respectively. So this vortice variable is pretty interesting. This allows me to uh, actually make it a straight line or a 
uh, vortice based on the multiplier here. So if I was to set this to zero uh, and we multiply by zero, it's a straight line. And uh, if I go crazy with it, then you can see it turns into a vortice. But this, uh, this slider, this vortice slider allows me to kind of create like almost like a taper. Okay, so uh, either we're a full vortex or we're doing some kind of weird tapering. Okay, so I hid some of this stuff just to make it uh, a little bit easier to see, but I just want to show you some of what this control uh, can do. So let me set that to one, the multiplier. And uh, if I increase this to a full vortice, it will actually spin the points uh, almost like in a perfect type of circle. Uh, these are the keyframes here. Uh, so just try to ignore that. Uh, but you can see as I animate this multiplier, it allows me to go from a straight line into a vortice. Yeah, so pretty cool. So if I was to increase the spline segments, you can see that um, this multiplier and this vortice allows me to make the bottom point kind of skinnier. So it's basically just multiplying the points as it goes out. So basically to sum this up with the um, with the math, it just allows me to have indice zero multiplied by one, indice one multiplied by two, so on and so forth, so that it increasingly gets bigger and bigger um, from, the, uh, from that point. So yeah, it allows me to have just a little bit more control over this and yeah animating this stuff is like super fun so the last thing i could show is the movie render queue setting so if i come into my configs uh, i have a custom config that i've saved here uh, it's pretty standard uh, just using the exr set to dwab i know i said <laughs> I don't know why I say that out loud, but it's so funny. DWAB, DWAB, uh, set the compression to that because it's very, it's very small, very compressed, and it's an excellent format to use. Uh, Anti-aliasing, this is set pretty dang high. Uh, 10 and 32 is probably too high. Uh, you could do like 4 and uh, four and 12 or something. That could be pretty good for you. Um, then I do set the render warm-up uh, count to pretty high since I'm using... Uh, the cloner system it's based on niagara and i have this set at least past 128 uh, you have to actually drag out the camera cut track to uh, allow to render these warm-up frames okay so uh camera is set here pretty standard uh, i do have these console variables that i've been uh, tinkering with and exploring um, i'll go ahead and make this a little bit larger on screen if you guys want to check this out and then i'll quickly just run through these settings that i have here um, they're pretty, they're pretty crazy, but this is stuff that I've just picked up from the community and also things I've just been tinkering with as, uh, Lumen and Nanite has evolved over the years with, uh, Unreal Engine 5. So, uh, some of the most notable things, let me see if I can find one that I think is pretty cool. Oh, the r.lumenscene.radiosity uh, hemisphere probe resolution. Uh, I set this pretty high. Um, I believe this takes a lot of VRAM. Um, so watch out for that, but, uh, it gives me some pretty interesting results for global illumination, uh, just a little bit higher quality and less flickering. Uh, it seems like, and then I also have this probe spacing set to one. Um, let's see, uh, by default. Oh, okay. So startup value is four. Uh, this is all these are basically set by scalability, which is interesting. Uh, but yeah, I've just kind of played with these. The ray tracing nanite mode, I have that set to one, which is the uh, the the console variable I showed you at the beginning to get nice ray tracing looks on nanite meshes. And then also this lumen translucency volume grid pixel size, uh, I have that set to sixteen as well. So. Um, yeah, just definitely something to try out in case you're noticing some areas um, that are looking kind of weird. Uh, the hardware ray tracing max iterations also set to 32. Uh, reflections temporal max frames accumulated, that's also set to uh, 32. So lower values cause the temporal filter to propagate lighting changes faster, but also increase flickering from noise. Okay, so some just uh, some different things. Oh, also reflections, bilateral filter num samples. Okay, set that to 32. 
Um, yeah, there's some there's some really long ones in here, uh, but all of these are kind of interesting. This radiance cache hardware ray tracing temporary buffer allocation down sample factor that's set to one. Um, yeah, but a lot of these things, like I said, uh, the higher or the more you play with these, the more unstable the engine's going to be. And this is just something that I've just played with um, in my time here in the engine. So uh, use with caution. Especially if you're using like 4K rendering and you're doing like uh, a lot of large uh, renders, be careful. <laughs> Don't say I didn't warn you. And then I also have game overrides ticked on. So this will tick off like all the game stuff. So like LODs and all that will be as high quality as, as they can be. So uh, definitely something to use. And uh, yeah, so... I think that kind of wraps it up. Okay, so as we close this video out, I just want to give a huge shout out to Bark and Byte for creating an incredible project to give me the inspiration to actually jump into Unreal Engine to see if I could recreate something in that vein, uh, something in that high-end motion graphics world. Uh, I had a super fun time just jumping in here after work and jamming on it. Of course, you guys know, uh, some of you guys know uh, that I do have a day job and that I do run two small businesses. So doing this on the side is definitely a big passion for me, uh, but something I don't have a lot of time for. So I appreciate all the support on social media for what you guys have given me for this project. It really pushed me to get this video out this weekend. So I really appreciate it. And if you guys have any questions or want to see future tutorials, definitely leave them in the comment section down below. I do read everything that is down there and try to respond to everyone so i really appreciate the support and i hope this was helpful for you let me know if you have any questions <laughs> but until next time we'll talk to you guys later thanks a lot